Good afternoon. Or no, good morning. It's still only 1045. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to see you all here. Um, more people are joining every minute. Um, so thank you. Thank you all for being here for um, creating access in rural communities. I'm particularly excited about this topic. Um, we at CSHA feel passionate about getting school-based health centers into rural communities in the Central Valley, in the Inland Empire, in the far north, anywhere that people want us to be, we are excited to help support the work there. So really, really excited for this presentation and really grateful to our friends Colleen and Nicole um, for being willing to present to us today. Um, some really quick housekeeping. Um, feel free to use the chat. We will be moderating. Also, feel free to put questions in the Q&A. Um, we'll hear from each of our presenters in turn, and we'll stop for Q&A in the middle. Um, so if you have questions, feel free to drop it there. I um, hope you're having a great conference so far. Maybe people are coming from storytelling. I'll be curious to hear how that was. And um, of course, Dr. Pender, his powerful presentation this morning. Hope you all got a chance to see that. And um, and I believe right after this, we hear from Tracy, our executive director. So hopefully you're having a full third day of conference. And um, thank you again for joining us. I will pass it over to Nicole. Hi, everyone. I'm getting ready to load my screens. Um, let's see, share screen, do this, hopefully it shares, hopefully you guys can see it. Um, so I'm Nicole Mesqueda, I'm the Chief Administrative Officer for Camarena Health and I'm excited to be here with um, my fellow colleague today, Colleen. Um, we're going to provide you with a presentation on um, what it means to provide school-based health models or healthcare um, delivery models in rural settings. I'm going to be coming at it probably more from an administrative role um, and provide you some insight and challenges and successes we've had and show share with you our models. And Colleen's going to be providing you with more of that clinical clinician aspect um, and her community. So thank you for joining us today and we're excited to share. So let me get, make sure I'm clicking. So overview of Camarena Health is what I'm going to um, provide today. I'm going to talk a little bit about what an FQHC is, share a little bit about Camarena Health, um, barriers we were faced with in serving our rural communities, uh, Camarena Health school-based health models, and then lessons learned from our school-based health models and our mobile um, health approaches because those have been supporting us as well getting to our rural communities. So um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar of what an FQHC is, but a slide here, it's a public health center that are focused on serving at-risk underserved populations. They offer access to comprehensive care, um, regardless of their ability to pay. And they're also known as community migrant health centers, community health centers, or 330 funded health organizations. Um, most of you probably have FQHCs in your area or rural health centers in your area. Um, our federally qualified health centers um, serve a large Medi-Cal population. Um, one thing that's very unique to the FQHCs is um, we receive some federal funding. For most of us, it's less than 20% of our overall federal funding budget, in particular for Camarena Health. Um, so we rely on other types of funding sources. Um, we also serve anyone and everyone that walks through our doors, whether they have the ability to pay as an FQHC. And we really worked to get our patients on different types of programs or services or enroll them in different types of insurances that they may qualify for. Um, however, we do offer a sliding fee scale for those that are unable to pay. Um, one of the things that I like to share is what's really unique about um, an FQHC is that 51% of our board is made up of patients who receive services in our health centers, who represent and understand our communities. So we're really guided by um, those individuals who understand um, and have received the care from our health centers. Um, for me, we're in the Central Valley, so Cameron Health's in Madera, California. These are some of our fellow um, <clears throat> FQHCs in the Valley. Um, there's quite a few more. But these are ones right here in the heart of the Central Valley. Um, and then they go all the way up to quite a few more um, health centers up and down the state. Um, one out of 12 FQHCs are, um, are one out of 12 people in the United States are receiving their care from an FQHC. So these are just some slides, 
very quickly to kind of share with you the impact that federally qualified health centers do have in communities and do have in rural communities. Um, so there's various different models of care. Some are large FQHC models and some are a little smaller. Some focus on different types of services and some have an array of services. So um, that's a little bit about FQHCs. And so I wanted to share a little bit about Camarena Health and who we are. We've been in the community for over 40, um, going on 41 years. We celebrated our 40th year during COVID. Um, and our mission is to promote healthy communities by providing quality and um, compassionate care to those that are in the community. Um, we have this next slide here. We are the largest primary care provider in Madera County with 19 health center locations. Our reach is in Madera, Chowchilla, Corsgold, Oakhurst, and Fresno. And for some of you that don't know, it's a very diverse range. Chowchilla looks very different from the heart of Madera. Course Gold and Oakers are at the gateway or the entryway going into Yosemite. So very different makeups of populations and needs that are being served in these communities. Um, our focus is though really on going outside our four walls and having that impact on health in our communities. Partnering with school districts, partnering with CBOs, with universities, um, really to transform just the overall health in our communities. So some of the services we provide, um, family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, women's health, optometry, chiropractic, behavioral health, telepsychiatry, dental, health education, nutrition, urgent care services, labs, x-ray services, and pharmacy. And so um, our models of care has really been to try to put as many of those services in our buildings and in single facilities as possible or create um, what we call campuses where um, patients can come and they can access all these services um, in one location. Many of our rural communities have trouble with transportation. Many of our patients walk. And then some of them just do not have the time or the capability to be able to get to and from different sites. So our, our focus over the past five years is to really, um, has been really to develop health centers that provide all of these services that you can walk in and get comprehensive care um, and you don't have to leave. Just at a glance of who Camarena Health's demographics were in 2020, um, over 60% of our patient population was a uh, Medi-Cal. We served 50,000 individuals in um, 2020. Um, we have quite a few of our patient population that are ag workers, 43, it always varies around 43 to 50 um, percent of our population come from ag working families. 41% um, of them are female, are, are males, and 59% are uh, females of our patient demographics. Um, our medical services is always our largest um, in, in serving with dental and behavioral health and then optometry services following shortly after. So I want to take a moment. I did put some questions in here. They asked us opportunities to engage. So if you all could take a few minutes, uh, or just a quick minute, and chat in your chat um, this question. What does your rule look like? What does your rule look like? Because everyone's rule is a little different. And in our F community health center world, all of our rules are very different. Um, so if you could just put in the chat what your rural community looks like near you. That's such a great question, Nicole. And we have lots of folks here, so I'm excited to hear from them. Um, we have about 50 people on the, the meeting, and I can tell that people are from Placer County, from Fresno, um, from San Bernardino, from Merced. I saw Humboldt. Humboldt, I think Humboldt was in there. Yep. <laughs> from the Yurok tribe. Um, so all kinds of different spread across the state. And we'll give folks just a couple minutes to chat because as I said, there's usually a delay. Um, we're hearing from, um, actually my sister-in-law up in Washington says, my rural community looks a lot like the picture behind you. Oh, <laughs> That's <great>. fun. <laughs> um, I hear, I see agricultural land, surrounded by graffiti. 
I like this um, sort of a, a metaphor, your question. I like it. <laughs> I, I tried. I think everyone has a different picture of what rule looks like. And that's important for us to understand is everyone's rule may be different. Mm -hmm. so I think I'm going to go ahead and move forward because I want to explain to you what my rule looks like because um, it's very diverse. And if you want to hear just a few more people said, um, behind the redwood curtain, surrounded by pine trees, agriculture with academia, people knowing people, mountains, creeks, rivers, rain, slides, similar to Madera County, unclean, unfortunately. So you got lots of good answers here that people can see in the chat. So, and I think that is important, and I wanted you each to share what your rule looks like because everyone's rule is different, and we can all, all of these models can work in this rule, and my rule is very different. So, as you can see on this slide, I know there's a bit of delay, but Madera County covers a very vast area, um, and in this green area up to the top of the map there in Oakhurst and Chowchilla, we are the gateway into um, Yosemite. And so our rural is a very mountain community um, with limited resources, limited services, limited services of medical and dental that pro that accept Medi-Cal. Um, and so that picture to the left is actually um, one of our lakes that's nearby one of our health centers. Uh, the picture to the bottom right there is our ag community because um, in Madera, in the heart of Madera and Chowchilla and some of our outlying areas, you have ag surrounding this whole community. <clears throat> and so um, we serve a large portion of farm workers. But then that top right picture right there may look very similar to what most of our neighborhoods look like. They've got school districts, they've got parks, they've got um, access to stores. And so um, as you can see, our my rule, I have two very rural populations that are very different in Serbia. And um, our models of care um, can be challenged at times. You think that one size can fit all, and it doesn't. And so um, I'm going to move to the next slide because I have another question for you guys. What are your biggest barriers for students and families in your rural communities? And this could be not just around healthcare, it could be around um, various different levels. So I'm going to let you just take a minute and put this in your chat. Yeah, we can all use that, that 10 second delay to take a deep breath and do a little stretch. So one barrier that's coming up is transportation. Yes, and that's seconded transportation to resources and supports. Um, some of the highest ACEs levels in the state, health insurance, health centers, access to mental health. We heard transportation again, transportation again, language barriers. Um, yeah, we're hearing a, a lot of the same echoes, not knowing the resources. Yeah. So those are all very similar echoes. And I think um, although we may be in different areas of rural, they're, they're very similar. And for us, these were some of the things that were outliers for us. So I moved to the next slide. Um, access to care, just having transportation, like many of you talked about, access to care. Lack of providers who accept Medi-Cal for medical and dental. Um, that was huge, especially in our mountain communities and our rural mountain communities that there were very few providers. There was actually uh, quite a few providers in those communities. They had limited hours, but they weren't accepting Medi-Cal or um, dental Cal. Types of services or lack of specialty services. We see that a lot in our rural communities. Lack of health services. Um, staff on campus. So when we're looking at our schools um, in some of our rural communities uh, and in our more um, prominent communities that are a little less rural, is our health service staff are being stretched thin. They're all they're they're teetering between multiple schools, um, and so that was one that came up. Lack of mental health providers in the community. Um, that I, I heard that in the track. Transportation is huge. Um, need for providers who understand community and population. So 
our providers that work in Madeira and work well with our patients in Madeira, they may not be working well with the same populations in our rural community or are with our ag farm workers. And so our providers needed to be um, needed to come and understand those communities. And I'll talk a little bit of how we were able to address that. Um, limited health services on campus. Uh, some school sites, especially in our rural, didn't have an easy way to access even just health services on campus. Um, they would have to go to the administration office. There would be limited resources available. Uh, students have limited places to access confidential services. Um, and, and so one of the things that came up primarily with Madera Unified School Districts is that was brought to our attention was absenteeism. And the school nurse and the health service coordinator staff were saying, on a regular basis, they were allowing students to go off campus to um, receive that care. And everyone in that community knew exactly where they were going to get confidential services. And so um, by having these models of care on the campus, students, your peers wouldn't know if you're going in for a dental checkup, a medical checkup, um, health education services, or why you were going into a health center where most of the students and the families knew why they were going off campus to access some of these services. Um, farm working families that can't leave work to get care. Um, that is a very common theme um, for us. And so um, those were some of the, the underlying issues that came up when we looked at bringing these services to our school-based services to our rural communities. Last question, I promise, but I, I wanted to try to engage you as much as possible. What would your ideal healthcare models look like for students and families in your rural communities? Um, if you could take a moment and just put this in the chat, and then maybe uh, Amy would be able to share a few of those. Absolutely, I can do that. While we're waiting for folks to get a chance to type that in, I'll just say that indeed we got um, the same echoes um, in the last answer, just like what you were saying, it, it seems like there's really so many themes. So someone said it's about 45 minutes to the closest mental health provider, that it's hard to find culturally complicated um, culturally competent care and access to specialty providers. So uh, really, we're hearing so many of the same themes. So we'll give folks a minute to answer your last question. This is a deeper question. It takes people a minute to think about it. <laughs> yeah. And if not, if people are, that's, it's fine. We can move on. I just wanted people to kind of think about what it is that would be ideal for that community. Um, what mm -hmm. type of services, because we all may think something's ideal, but it, just really understanding those communities is very important. Mm -hmm. We had one great answer from up in Humboldt, integrated services, mobile outreach to meet people where they're at, um, utilizing schools as a community hub. Then we heard from Alma, who you know, wraparound services for all members of the family. Um, Placer, Placer's echoes what um, Humboldt is saying. Um, resources for families. Yeah, lots of, of agreement and echoes around those. Okay, I am going to move to the next slide because I think some of these models that I'm going to show you in my next slide. So. Um, the next few slides, so for our ag communities, some of the ideals were access to care in the evenings, weekends, and at work. So we talked about some of these, but as we went back and started listening more and going into these communities, um, we, were, we were understanding each of our role. Easy access to health education and behavioral health services, more specialty services available. If you're a migrant worker or cannot afford employee benefits, so grow, grower incentive programs, providers that understand population needs, and dental care access. So I want to just highlight a few things of what we did around these two these areas. So um, we have some pretty large growers in Madeira. Um, some are some known nationally for their size and what they do. Um, but they came to us committed to support their employees with employee health. And at the time, we didn't have a mobile unit, a mobile health unit. And so we began working with them and go. they would host annual or a couple of times a year, large harvest festivals for their for their employees and their families. And a part of it was doing some 
health needs assessments and biometrics. So we began doing biometrics of our our agricultural workers at, at these at these areas, understand some of their health needs, where they were at. We were doing screenings, and then we were getting providers to them. And one ag, uh, one grower went as far as he was so committed um, to doing this that he ended up taking and putting um, a, a health center uh, in his um, uh, headquarter area for his workers, and a very minute small, I can't say it's a full health center, a small medical exam room with a waiting area where our providers could come in and be able to do some of this work with them, screen them. If it was more intensive, they would get them into a health center and really work around that. Our hours are really geared towards um, evenings and weekends for our working populations, that whether it's the farm workers or other working populations. So we have Saturday and Sundays available for medical and dental services. We have evenings till eight o'clock at night. We have urgent care services as well. Um, but with our ag community, we were also able to begin looking at some really grower, really interesting grower incentive programs. Um, some of their employees still couldn't access the Medi-Cal services. They had limitations to that. They couldn't access, they couldn't afford the benefits that their employer was providing. And so we worked with them to be able to provide um, and invoice the grower for some of these services, just your general medical and dental services, as well as some behavioral health services. So they're able to come in to our health centers and access that, and we partner with the grower to offset some of those costs um, to ensure that they're getting the care that they need. Um, for our mountain communities, this was very much, the, the, our mountain communities were very different on some of the things that they felt were very important to them. They wanted us to be present in the community, they wanted it to have a local feel. They wanted to find trust and they wanted to see that you were committed and you would show up. Our small town communities, um, tend, uh, like our rural um, Oakhurst and Coarse Gold area, Mariposa areas, that was very important to them. The relationship aspect with the, the care teams in the community were very important. So a little bit different than our ag population in that, um, they they really wanted to see us present. Um, dental care access was, uh, there were multiple dental providers, but none of them were providing dental services to Medi-Cal patients. Um, limited health service um, staff on campus, we saw this pretty prominent in our rural area. Um, limited access to specialty services or even an urgent care service and x-ray services. So we, we ended up um, putting in dental and urgent care in these communities so that they would have access to all of that. Um, confidential services in a small town can be overwhelming, um, and that was a common theme. And then limited internet. Um, and for those that are in the really rural communities, it does make an impact on how you provide care and that access to care. So I wanted to, um, I'm moving to my next slide and I hope I click that audio button um, and I hope it works. Uh, Amy, if you could just let me know if it does. I wanted to, I have a few videos that I'll show you and then I'll wrap up. Um, but I wanted to show you some of our models of care. This first one is our first Madera South School-Based Health Center on a very large campus that um, serves a large farm working population. And so it has a community and a, um, a community access as well as a secure school access. Um, and so I'm gonna show the video and hopefully you guys bear with me if there's not audio issues. <laughs> We are on the Madera South campus um, in the Camerona Health Center. So uh, Camerona provides. Ooh, did it stop? <laughs> it, it just stopped, but it was sounding great. <laughs> okay, I will get it back up to that area. I'll just queue it up. Just give me a second. Also, just FYI, you have about five more minutes. Okay, so 
I'm going to show this model, and then we I'll just talk the about Dara the South campus um, in the Camerona Health Center. So uh, Camerona provides a wide range of services, medical and dental. Um, so I'm a dentist here at Camerona, so we do fillings, cleanings, root canals, crowns, extractions, full range. For students, having Camerona here on campus is great because they can come in, saves time like getting to the dentist because we are on campus, so less time out of the classroom. Also, if they're having a toothache, um, we can service them right here on, on uh, campus. I'm one of the school nurses at Madera South. It's a real benefit having the health center here, um, convenience-wise for students and parents. Um, a lot of times with a lot of our families, transportation is an issue. Also, parents don't have to take off from work, um, and it gets the students, they can be seen and then return to class, so they're not missing as much school. The benefit of the school-based health center being located in the high school is Pretty convenient. We're open 7:30 to 4:30, so they can come before class starts. So Cameron is big on helping the community, and this is just a great uh, branch of Cameron being here on campus because access is always important for healthcare, and having dental and medical on the campus is great for the community. Anyone can be seen at the Cameron Center, which is really nice, and they've placed it strategically. Um, so that it serves a lot of schools and, and you know, the community nearby. Okay. Looks good in the corner. Okay. Slides or whatever you want. I'm gonna I'm gonna pass through the next few slides, um, and the reason for that is because there are more videos, and we can send the links out. So this next video is a video of our Matilda Torres School Based Health Center. All of our school based health centers that are brick and mortar have medical, dental, and behavioral health services, and we have the school nurses office inside of the the school-based health center so the students come through and see the school nurse on the school side and then the community has this secure private access um, it's been wonderful to be partnered up with the school nurse and the health service staff we collaborate greatly on that um, these are some of our our, our health centers i'm going to move to the next slide um, and as you can see some of them are um, very much uh, cater to different needs and different populations. So um, one of our health centers is in Chowchilla on the far right upper hand corner. Our Oakhurst Health Center has a little bit more look and feel of our mountain community um, on the bottom left corner. Our Matilda Torres School-Based Health Center is on the bottom right corner. Um, and that is a part of the brand new high school that was built. And then on the upper left hand corner, um, you will see our, um, our medical building right in the heart of Madeira. Um, one of the things in our rural mountain communities was transportation. There's quite a drive. And so um, we knew we couldn't just do a brick and mortar in some of those areas as much as we want to and we hope to get there. Um, but for our school partners, um, the students are driving, there's hour drives from the heart of Mariposa um, for many of the families who are coming into school or bringing their young children to school. And then some of the elementary schools from the heart of Mariposa are an hour and a half drive on um, Windy Mountain Roads. And so we partnered with the school district to do a mobile medical and dental unit um, to bring care to them. We also have our own Camarena Health um, mobile health unit that currently today is actually out at the Harvest Festival for one of our large growers um, and will be um, uh, providing biometrics, health screenings, and doing referrals for patients. So we're very excited. This mobile unit goes around both in our, our Madera communities and our ag communities, but also in our um, 
medical up in our rural communities that don't have access. Very quickly, here are some pictures of some of our farm, working, farm workers and the growers that are accessing care. I think this was a flu shot clinic last, um, last year, actually, and we're doing flu shot clinics today. So what has worked, and I will briefly go through these because I want Colleen to have plenty of time. Um, <clears throat> district and school board buy-in and support. <coughs> Excuse me annual staff and administration training. Uh, <clears throat> we've done nurse health service staff and front office staff coordination. That's been very successful and why our school-based health centers have worked so well in our both our rural communities and through the mobile unit and brick and mortar. Excuse me, while I take some water. Warren handoff models with vice principals and counseling services around mental and behavioral health with our mental and behavioral health clinician. We have models where we work with the school um, staff at our brick and mortar sites where if they're meeting with a parent and a student, a reoccurring student who's been um, in trouble and coming up to the office quite a bit, <coughs> we have opportunities where our behavioral health clinicians go and meet the, the school staff and the parents right then and there. So what brought challenges to us? And I'm gonna skip over the last slide and I apologize. Um, <clears throat> making this model profitable. School-based health center model, the brick and mortar models like we built, uh, the, you know, we knew that it was gonna take some time to build up that trust with the school community as well as the community. Um, we diversified our services to add medical, dental, and behavioral health. That was really helpful. And we were patient. And I think that's one of the things that you have to be when you're doing this model, is that if you're looking for a profit, and it wasn't about profit for us, it was really about serving these um, undermet needs in our school populations with both students and families, in our rural community as, as well as here. And if the brick and mortar uh, struggles, um, with profitability early on, you can imagine that mobile health units when you only have two exam rooms and one provider and trying to get services through and not being able to see as many patients as you would in brick and mortar. It takes some time. And so all of these models were not models for us to sit there and look at and say, we're going to make money, 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 and it be profitable for us. It was really to serve a gap in the community, a need in the community around absenteeism, around mental and behavioral health around health um, health access for our students as well as the communities for their families and the teachers so um, that was a, that's always a huge challenge and I, I think if you remember if you put the mission of what you're doing um, and the purpose of it I think it, it it brings benefits and strides in so many different ways than just that profitability of reimbursement <clears throat> However, you do have to be profitable, and we've been successful with that. And I think by diversifying your ser services that you offer there, that also helps um, bring in some of that profit. Uh, brick and mortar versus mobile health models. I'm going to tell you really quickly, you need to outweigh those. I think we have challenges in our rural communities getting our mobile unit to some of the areas. We're limited on what we can do there. Um, it, it's more cost beneficial, I would say, it, it, but we have plus and minuses on both. Um, consent forms with parents and getting those back in rural communities were challenging. Confidential services and how to access those on a mobile health unit. Um, access to both female and male providers, that was important for our, our, our student population to have access to that, both of them. So our, our male students felt comfortable coming in as much as our female students did. Um, I'm going to just skip through these slides and I want to wrap up here. I have other opportunities to impact healthcare in our rural communities. Um, we focus a lot on career technical education, um, with CTE, engaging our students to consider healthcare pathways. Um, we have huge workforce shortages in our rural communities. And us by doing this and doing teaching health center models with our high school and middle school, middle school students, we have been able to see many of these students come back and provide care, 
not only in our centers in these rural communities, but also our, our hospitals and other systems. And so I would tell you when you have workforce shortages, you need providers who understand your rural communities. Start with your youth, start with your healthcare pathways, give them opportunities because if they believe in themselves and believe that they can come back in this community and provide that care, then they will. Um, and so these are just talking about some of our, our CTE models that we do around um, serving our rural communities and the healthcare pathway programs to get our students college and career ready. Um, many of our students are graduating with CNA certificates, becoming LVNs, um, being hired on. Many of them are going into some of our teaching health center programs and allowing for hometown endorsements. We have quite a few um, ATSU PA students who have been hometown scholars where we were able to endorse them. They were accepted into the master's level program. They came and did clinicals with us and in our health centers out in the community in our rural areas and they have stayed on as providers with us. And so um, I'm gonna wrap up there and let it go over to Colleen. I'm sorry, Colleen. Nicole, that was perfect. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. That is amazing information. And it makes me think about the things that I can do in the future, like a mobile van sounds great. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screens here and then um, we can talk about what my version of rural looks like because it is pretty different. And I started in a much smaller group of administrative services and in um, a very rural area. So um, I'm Colleen McAvoy again. I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner. So I am coming at this from more of a background in um, providing services and don't have much of an administrative background. But when I started as a nurse practitioner, I started at a school-based health center in Oakland, actually working with Amy Ranger and other school-based providers at La Clinica. And I moved, I love the mountains, so I moved to the Eastern Sierras Bishop um, about six and a half years ago now. And this is a picture of Bishop from the airport, the little airport we have, and that's the backside of the Sierra Mountains. So I'm on the other side of that huge Sierra range from Nicole, and um, this is what I'm looking at. So I moved over here in um, to this rural area, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the challenges I faced moving here and trying to start a school-based health center and some special considerations to think of, some of the confidentiality. Nicole talked about some of the challenges of my patients and the families I work with over here and some of the great things that have come of it. And um, so Bishop is, if you're not familiar with it, Bishop is over here in the backside of the Sierras, like I said, a little south of the Bay Area in Inyo County and Inyo County, you know, has only 18,000 people. So the challenges our families face are like everyone's talking about a lot of distance and travel to get to places. Um, families have to travel from Bishop like four and a half hours to Los Angeles to see a specialty provider. They have to go to Reno three and a half hours. If you're lucky, you can get to Reno in three and a half hours. To, and they don't take Medi-Cal, so Medi-Cal patients can't get seen there. And um, so we're really remote, even though we're still in California, people cannot you know, get services. And we have a small population, which is nice in some ways, but in other ways, we don't have the ability to have specialty services. So the population of the town of Bishop is about 4,000. And there's about 10,000 people in the surrounding areas here. Bishop can't grow much because most of the land is owned by LIDWP. If you know about water rights in California, they bought the land. So it's not going to expand much. This is about it. And now most of the area is parks or mountainous. Um, historically, the area has been pretty conservative politically, which posed some challenges in starting a school clinic, which I did for high schoolers who, who, where we wanted access to contraception. That was challenging. We have a large Native American population. There's reservations at Bishop, Big Pine, Independence, and Long Pine. And they have um, Toyabi Indian Health Services has clinics here in other areas in the, you know, other counties in the area like Mono County, they serve them too. So 
there's about, like I say, 18,000 people in the whole county. So it's small. Again, that's where it is. Um, it is remarkably beautiful, but this is um, looking down at our little town from over in the White Mountains. So that's where we are. And I started a school clinic at the high school in Bishop. And I have dreams about getting a mobile van and expanding down the Eastern Sierra to see the adolescents in Lone Pine, the other town south of here in Big Pine. But for now, we're still working on this. And um, our population here is primarily Caucasian. We do have 13% Native American and 21% um, Latino population, some Asian and some African American. So again, you know, the challenges adolescents face when they're trying to access confidential services, as you everyone is talking about, are transport in this really small town of 4,000 people. 10,000 people come from the little outlying areas. Some people come from Big Pine, south of there, to go to high school in Bishop. People come from Benton, you know, a town out, uh, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but out by Mammoth Lake. So they come from all these other areas you know, for high school here, but um, it's a small town. So, but Inyo County has the highest mountain in the continental United States, Mount Whitney. We also have the lowest point in the United States in Death Valley at Badwater Basin, just some facts. So I work at um, Northern Inyo Healthcare District and the district runs a 25 bed critical access hospital in Bishop and specifically what work in the pediatric clinic. We have an allergy component to our practice in Bishop and the district also runs a rural health center for primary care, a women's health clinic, surgery clinic, internal medicine and orthopedics. The hospital delivers a couple hundred babies a year and many of those come from outlying areas like in Nevada, they transport here you know, a lot of those people deliver here as well. So basically there's three pediatricians and myself in the practice, and we're the pediatric practice in the what's called Owens Valley here, and that's it. If we have really sick patients, they get flown out. Um, we don't have a neonatal intensive care unit, a PICU, nothing like that. That's the hospital. So, you know, in talking about rural clinics in rural areas in California, like we are the one in Inyo, yay! And um, this other Northeast part of California does not have any school-based health centers, and I'm sure they would love to as well, because there's so many benefits, as we all know, since we're here. Um, so according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, they just came out with a article from the Council on School Health on School-Based Health Centers, and they said there are about 2,500 school clinics nationwide, and about 36% of those are rural. So that's pretty good, but we could increase it. And there are great things that can come from a rural clinic. And um, the need is huge because these adolescents, as you all know, don't have access to confidential services usually. And maybe they don't want to go to their rural health center and see like their aunt works there, their cousin works at you know, Toyabi Indian Health Services. When you have like a town of 4,000, maybe with 10,000, you eventually you know everyone and everyone knows, kind of knows you a little bit or recognizes you. And, you know, when I was young, it was very awkward to walk into the pharmacy and even buy tampons and every woman needs them or to buy condoms. Like, you know, you have to go in and at the small pharmacy here, Dwayne's like people from the high school work there. And, so you're probably all familiar with the challenges of really small towns, but it's really important that these youth have a way to access services because as I'll talk about in a second, pregnancy rates are higher um, in rural areas um, due to access of, lack of access to confidential services and probably for other reasons, but it's really helped helpful but you know also when I first moved here, I think it was the first week I first month I moved here and i was in the rural health center seeing a patient and it was a teenager and she said oh you know i really want birth control because i'm having sex and i can't get it because i can never get away from my parents to get it i mean of course somehow she was still finding a way to you know have sex but she was um you know uh, unable to get away enough because she lived in about 20 minutes out of town to get condoms or anything. And I was like, oh, I couldn't really get it to her. She didn't want Depo Provera. And I was like, how am I going to do this? And so it's been very satisfying as four years later, I came back and, um, 
saw her sister at the high school clinic and got her on birth control when she was like in ninth grade. So that was good because these people really don't, it's hard for them. And one thing I learned of recently, which was really challenging, of course, access to abortion um, is very difficult in an area like this. Like you can't even go to Reno. I think you have to go to Bakersfield or Fresno, which is about six hours from here because you drive down and around the Sierra. So I had an adolescent who became pregnant recently who wanted to uh, terminate her pregnancy and she was able to um, access an abortion. You can now have um, RU46 sort of, you know, delivered to your home, which is actually safe and really effective. So if you don't know about that in a rural area, it was pretty amazing. It saved her. Regardless of one's beliefs of abortion, it is, still legal. Anyway, so this article I saw does point out that um, nationally, the teen pregnancy rate is declining, but in rural areas, that wasn't the case in 2010. It was about a third higher in rural areas than the rest of the country, which is to be expected. Um, so I moved here, like I say, six and a half years ago, and I worked in the practice I work at. And, you know, once I moved over, I definitely wanted to possibly start a school-based health center because, you know, I think they're great. And I like working with adolescents. And I wanted to, you know, when I would see my patients in the exam room, you know, I would have their patients step out, their parents step out for, you know, and ask us to do a psychosocial assessment. How are things going? And, you know, they really, when they're in their pediatric practice with you, they don't talk to you the same way they do when you're in the school-based health center. They just you know, we're getting the same access to services. And as we all know, being in a school clinic, they reach out, I feel like, in a really different way. So I wanted to do that. And the pediatrician I was working with, Charlotte, was like, yeah, this sounds great. But we gave it a couple years and sort of felt things out a little bit. And um, then we started to reach out to someone on the school board. And luckily when we brought it up at the time, the hospital CEO was a pediatrician and he saw the need for this as well. So we reached out to some people at the high school and started talking to them about what we would, you know, if they wanted us to do that, you know, start a school clinic or not. And of course they were really interested so that was great but you know it was challenging it's been in many ways the most satisfying job of my career you know and kind of a dream job but in the other way it's been really challenging because we're in such a small area and we have such a small hospital and such a small community like you need people who understand how are we going to get this licensed how are we going to you know com you know make sure we're complying with everything we definitely needed hospital buy-in which fortunately we had about making sure we're setting it up correctly and it, you know there's a financial outlay to get it going i mean i definitely reached out to the school-based health center alliance a lot and asked a lot of questions they were probably sick of me but how do i do this how do i do that and i read their startup guidebook and it was but it was really hard to figure out um how to get this going anyway so luckily like and there were like a lot of it issues like small town how do you set up your computer system so that when there's limited employers in a town of like four to six thousand coming here you know and there's 600 kids at the high school how do you make sure that a medical record for the girl at the high school whose mom works in the lab at doesn't see her results. Yes, there's HIPAA, and we all know we're supposed to follow HIPAA, but you really need these youth to feel comfortable coming in and feel safe that their confidentiality is provided. And um, so we wanted to have the charts locked down, and it, a lot of people probably know how challenging that is. Unfortunately, I feel like electronic health records don't do a great job of, um, protecting adolescent confidentiality. They make it really hard. Um, or, you know, it's not as good as I might like. So we figured out some things, but it was challenging because no one here had ever done this. I was the only person from a, who had ever worked in a school-based health center. So it was sort of from the ground up. Anyway, I wonder if I should stop and see if there's any questions or comments. Um, so far, we don't have any specific questions, just lots of appreciation. 
Um, if people want to chat or Q&A any comments or questions they have, I can read them to Colleen, but I think people are just excited about what you're telling us, Colleen. Okay, well, I will keep going then. Um, so anyway, that was just some of my challenges. So as I say, it was like I was here for a few years and then we started talking to the hospital CEO. He was excited about it. Um, we talked to a school board member. He was excited. Then we met with the administration from the high school and they were excited because even though this was a more conservative community and some of my friends who grew up here said, I can't believe you even got this done because of that there's birth control at the high school is like scandalous. But um, luckily this school board and I mean, the um, school administration really saw the need, you know, in their students for something like this. And the services we set out to provide was I wanted to do family planning, but I also wanted to provide sick visits and, you know, some medical support for depression and anxiety and not just have it be about reproductive health because I felt like then kids are stigmatized if they come in, it means they're sexually active. So we wanted to provide all the services we could. I dream of having a dental clinic and an ophthalmology clinic because we don't have Medi-Cal places for, it's really hard to get glasses for kids basically with Medi-Cal and anyway, um, so it took five months of meetings between the school board and the hospital board and the school board. Every month I went to these two of these meetings a month and there was debate about can we have birth control in high school and I came up with evidence that this does not promote sexual debut if you give, you know, adolescent females or males contraception, it just protects them from getting pregnant and getting sexually transmitted infections. And the reality is most youth are having sex before they leave high school. So, and I provide, you know, promoted the other things we were gonna provide there as well, the, you know, help and support for depression and anxiety and like, um, you know, sick visits and how great this is, how great school clinics are for parents, you know, who don't wanna leave work and take their kid to get a strep test. So eventually it went through, but they will not, did not want, there were a lot of abstinence only people in the community who did not like it. Um, and, we started with the caveat that I cannot on-site dispense um, Plan B, emergency contraception, just because some people feel like it's um, an abortion, which I, it is not, but that was like, okay, we'll let that go. So, you know, and we started and we thought we had things set correctly, and then a new legal team came in and they wanted us to do stuff. So during, we did close a little bit and remodel during that pandemic and now we're taking medical and we are um getting set up with family packed as well so this is the high school the clinic is down in the you know basement where there's a larger health office and you know at first the ceo of the hospital was like well let's just see if the kids come and see what happens and you know i was flooded with students i mean there were a lot of first we started one day a week and it was just me now we're two days a week and we also have a male provider that comes every other you know once a, a couple times a month and so male students can see him if they want to and we're billing and you know the IT setup is better because it used to be like I mean all the things I as a provider didn't really know about administrative stuff like it was I mean I have support administratively but I'm also the I'm the provider and I'm the manager and so like you know making sure we had um our IT setup, they put in our own server because we would take our computers back and forth because they wouldn't work well on the VPN and we couldn't print and we couldn't do this. And you're just like, oh my God, like, can I just get this going? So it has been a super challenge, but it is, again, also very exciting. Um, and the response of the high school students has been great overall. I feel like there's I, I like I say I don't think it's just family planning I know these students in a way that is really different from when I just saw them in primary care clinic once a year they come in for headaches stomach aches um, it, it provides youth an opportunity to learn how to access care on their own so I had regular adolescents who like this one you know kids who don't have a lot of support from their family, she would come in and be like, my stomach hurts, this hurts, I need to take these blood pressure meds, help me with this. And 
So it's just a really exciting, really different um, relationship as a provider that I've developed with these youth. And it's really exciting to see them around town and have them be like, hi, you know, it's, it's, it's awesome. So anyway, but I also have been inundated with depression and anxiety visits and I have done a lot of extra training in mental health but I could use a counselor there as all rural health areas we don't have that so we're working on that and hopefully in the future and hopefully in the future we'll be doing physicals as well there it's a really small space as I'll show you in a second so it's really hard to do everything um, in that little space and I have dreams about expanding further and getting more space, but space is limited at the school. And so, um, anyway, so this is the space. So I have this one little room right here and over here on the right, that's the outer health office where there's a school health clerk that sits there and she triages patients and she's there every day of the week when I'm not. And she, um, we work closely. So, you know, if they have a headache, stomach ache. So it's, you know, and then I use this one room on the left. That's two pictures of that. And that room on the left is um, where I am in the medical assistant who comes with me. And she also does, you know, the registration and enrollment. And so it's a lot for this one medical assistant to know how to do. And it's still, you know, work in progress since we just reopened really in September after the pandemic hit, we, um, like I say, took some time. So we reopened and it's, you know, just trying to get everything going um, again, which is exciting. So this, that's all I really had to say actually, but this is um, a picture of, a tree obviously one of the oldest trees on the planet lives in the white mountains which are opposite of the sierras it's a bristlecone pine an ancient bristlecone pine and this is the sierra in the background you can see the sierras so that is really all i had to say i um do think it is well worth the effort to put in to try to get this done like i say it's been one of the more challenging but yet gratifying uh, experiences of my career, but it is definitely not easy. <laughs> and I don't have that background in um, administrative stuff, so. Yeah, it seems like you wear a lot of hat in that role, but I can see how gratifying it must be. Yes. Um, that was Perfect timing, Colleen, because we have about 15 minutes left if people have any questions or comments um, for either Colleen or Nicole or for the group. Um, we heard from Dennis and Merced who said he appreciates your patience with moving this forward. Um, Rebecca from West Ed said she loves seeing all the pictures and videos. It's great to see examples sort of, I, guess, I was going to say in real life, I guess we're not in real life, but you know, real examples on the screen. <laughs> Um, and Alma had echoed, yes, indeed, that confidentiality in small towns is so challenging. So definitely lots of appreciation. Um, here's a different question for Nicole. Um, you mentioned warm handoff models. Can you provide another example of what this approach looks like? So the way what we've done is we've done some staff training, both uh, with our clinicians, um, our, our two providers that are that they go between our two um, school-based health centers, as well as our behavioral health providers. And so we've done um, training with them, but also staff training on um, at the school campuses of when you may need assistance from one of our providers. More so, it tends to be more so on the medical, I mean, on the mental and behavioral health side. And so our behavioral health clinician um, basically are the vice principals who do a lot of the counseling services and meet with the parents on students that may have reoccurring challenges on campus or with it, their classes, they will um, call over to our clinical <clears throat> um, provider, see if they have a patient. If they don't have a patient, they ask them to come over um, to their office. And so our, um, our LCSW will then go over to their office, um, introduce herself to the parents, introduce herself to the students, 
Um, it may be a teacher that's also calling. And so if the teacher calls directly, she'll go into the classroom or outside of the classroom. She'll maybe come over and see how she can support the students. Um, and so it's a way for the parent and the student or the student in some cases by themselves to just meet the behavioral health clinician to understand what types of services, how maybe they could talk to them, um, how they can access the services during the school day, and just get them comfortable with that provider. A lot of times it's that stigma around mental and behavioral health. And so we've done a lot of campaigns on campus around break the stigma. And one of the ideas was to have our clinicians more present and working more closely with um, the administration at that campus as, as well as the teachers to kind of do those warm introductions to the students. I really look forward to a day when I can have a mental health provider there. That would be so awesome. <laughs> it is really the huge, you know, and I think it always is for everybody in society, but adolescents, I think specifically after the pandemic, you know, the isolation and everything that happened, it's so nice to be able to provide that service. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's so, go ahead, go ahead, Nicole. Well, no, the medical provider oftentimes gets called if there's fights on campus or there's a laceration. And so there's a lot of those kind of calls more on the medical side, but on our behavioral health sites, really where we do a lot of those warm handoffs. That's great to hear. And absolutely, I think, um, Colleen, we have heard so many medical providers say that the need for behavioral health is so deep and so wide and that they just really, really value and need that partnership. So that is definitely an echo that we hear. And um, we have another great question. Um, in regards to engagement, what did you both do to promote school-based health centers to students and families, especially when you were first starting? Yeah, that's a good question. I um, have done outreach. I go to the classrooms and talk to the students about the school-based health center. We, you know, I'm continually working on that. I feel like as I'm reopening and setting it up again I, there's so much i want to do like i want to get some peer health involvement and get some of the youth with me to go to the classrooms and talk to the students about why they like coming to the clinic or what the clinic does instead of just me being there going blah blah as an adult having the youth involvement i mean there are so many things i learned working in oakland that could do to do outreach but i feel like there's only so many hours in the day but you know i did reach out to classrooms talk to teachers and we have hopes to expand our website and a lot of other things we've done a lot of social media and we link and collaborate with the school social media posts and all the student social media clubs and different things that are taking place that's been very beneficial and we do a lot of tour so you saw um, one video, but we do a lot of videos, virtual tour videos. We do videos that are on topics for our students that are really targeted towards students that can be shared out in 30 second bits with social media or over different platforms that the students or the schools or the teachers may use. We've done a lot of teacher like classroom presentations and going in. We, we also work with some youth advisory groups on campus around mental and behavioral health um, our peer-to-peer -peer groups, we work with our CTE classes and students in those classes. We give them tours of the, of the health center so that they can be advocates on campus. Um, social's been the best way. We've tried some commercial campaigns and billboard campaigns through some funding we had to support our Break the Stigma campaign. And we really saw that social media um, was kind of the best way to reach them and reach our teachers and administration. Um, so that's been helpful to be able to link and collaborate on the school side and the district side on pushing those out um, and pushing them out not only to the students but also the parents um, so like the parent connects or the peach jars or some of those platforms to trying to link those in so that parents have access to it those are such helpful tips and actually that brings up a good point about um, teacher and staff engagement. Are there any particular messages that you have found to be most effective in terms of getting um, school staff and teacher buy in? Like what has convinced them that it's that it's worth it to, you know, take students out of class maybe or have you on campus? You know, I'm lucky. I feel like I've had this 
overall, the school staff has been really supportive. Uh, I think providing other services aside from the family planning has been really helpful. Like, you know, ibuprofen, then you can, you know, if I'm there as a nurse practitioner, I can dispense ibuprofen, give them pain meds for headache as long as I have parent consent and send it back to class. The health clerk can't do that. They can't just, you know, make it easy for them to return back to class. And, you know, they're, as we probably know, since we're here, there's a lot of evidence that school-based health centers help keep children in schools and staff like that too. So, and I think moving forward as we work on doing, everyone always wants their pre-participation physicals and sports physicals, trying to do those there will be helpful. You know, we have some limitations or hesitancy about doing it there to start. Well, you see our space, it's not large. We don't have vaccines, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics really likes them to have a medical home, but we're working on making that possible because it's always hard for adolescents to plan ahead and get their sports physical when they need it. So it's a work in progress. It's a continuing work in progress, but luckily the staff has been amazingly supportive. We've done some staff trainings. Um, we'll go in and do staff development trainings. And just educate them on services, how students can access it, how they can access it, what the process is. We have a process, a partnership with the school on the process of calling the student out, getting them to the nurse's office, and then coming into the health center, going back through the nurse's office and getting back to class. And so there was some education. We started it and teachers were like, we need to understand this more. And so we stepped back. And so every year we do staff development and teacher training as well as district understanding and staff development trainings as well great yeah i want to do great. that too yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <those laughs> okay, they should give me a staff of like five <laughs> i think colleen needs a little more and, and it's usually and i have to talk to you about how to get that mobile van going because i want <laughs> one of those too <laughs> Yeah, and it's usually not our clinicians that go and do some of the staff training. Right. It's usually some of the yeah. support staff mm -hmm. and different ones mm -hmm. because they're providing care during that time usually on campus. Right, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure any tips and tools that you all are, you know, training curriculums or presentations that you all have to share that people can use that they would um, definitely appreciate. We had a specific request for um, clinical protocols. Um, from Dennis and Merced, um, do either of you have written clinical protocols that you'd be willing to share? Um, and I'm sure that they do, Dennis, if you want to chat a little bit more about what kind in particular you'd be looking for or any particular topics, um, then we can try to gather those and send them out to the full group in, um, in after a conference. But yeah, Colleen and Nicole, do you have anything to add there? I don't have a lot of clinical protocols yet. We're working on that stuff as I get my ad needs to the team together but also maybe nicole has things she can her clinics she can share with have, me mm -hmm. we, um <laughs> you know we tend to have our protocols kind of streamlined from for all of our sites but then we tailor them per site so i guess i'd really need to maybe um uh understand a little bit more what they're looking for um our school-based health center protocols are a little different on some of the the um, things that we can do with our students and don't do with our students because of parent consent. Some mm -hmm. of our processes are a little different. Um, we are also changing some processes around uh, vaccines and we've had to kind of re redo some processes with that of what's acceptable and what to do when parents not there. Um, and so we've got quite a few policies and processes that we can share. I would just want to know exactly where. So I'd be happy to follow up or if they put their information in the chat to you, Amy. Um, the other mm -hmm. area that we have been redoing some processes around are around our foster youth and our homeless youth. Um, there's a lot of uh, steps that need to be done on um, with forms for social services and different groups that are, are facilitating and the school district. and um, we're not always, so we're putting some processes right now in, in regards to providing care during the day, school day around those populations. That's a little different. That's a great point. And yeah, we'd be happy to collect any um, protocols or any other resources that are helpful and send them out to the full group. We are um, updating currently our Vision to Reality Toolkit, which is a startup toolkit and trying to have more um, sort of downloadable, protocols and forms and MOUs and 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 quick 
tools that people can just grab and go. Um, so th that should be on our website in the next couple of months as well, and we will send that out. And we do have one last question that I'll ask in our last five minutes. Um, Rebecca asked, one of the attendees mentioned in the chat that culturally competent care is a challenge in their rural communities. Is that a challenge that you two have faced, and do you have any strategies to address this? Yes, it is a challenge I think we have faced. I mean, not directly that my students talk about it, but as I said, we have a large Native American population here and there is a Native American liaison in the school. So I've reached out to her and try to keep a, you know, her in the loop and get her to give me suggestions about how to make everyone comfortable. Yeah, we um, we have that both when working with our student populations and our farm working populations around our approach, our Mixteca and Oaxacan populations. We have a large Mixteca and Oaxacan population. Um, our rural communities are very different in their approach as well. Um, they're very personal, relationship based, small. They want to know more about you. They want to where your family goes to school. Where do you live? Where you are part of the community? Um, their needs they feel like in our rural community that mountain community feels like they are very different from the rest of madera county and that we can't treat them the same and they we need providers that understand that and so one of the things that we've really done and i'm we have begun growing our own providers from these communities we have been supporting for clinical rotations looking at different programs that these students or these young adults are accessing and doing um, in their communities, from our rural communities, what type of medical programs are they going into? What schools are they at? How can we support them with their clinical placements? Um, how can we get them engaged, offer scholarship opportunities for them so that they um, get trained and they come back and they provide care in these communities? As you all know, many of our, our students who go away and do the residency, do some of their other clinical didactics, they tend to um, uh, take their jobs or their first jobs in those communities that they're doing their residency and didactics in, um, and they don't always come back to the communities. And so we have been really strategic on our developing our workforce and, and growing our own for our rural communities, in particular, our mountain communities. That's great. I like it. We should do that. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I like it. <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely that's part of the thing when coming to a small town. I felt like I had to be here for a little while and build some trust as you as a person and you as a provider because, you know, there's people who come and go and go through here a lot. And I think it really matters to the families here that you've been here and you're going to be here and they know that you're competent um, in your skills as a provider. Um, so yeah and we have of course like a, you know everywhere now i think honestly it has a shortage of employees it's just really hard to find medical assistance it's hard to find lvns and it's even worse with the pandemic it's hard to provide medical providers um they do have a cna program at the school so i talk to them a lot as well but definitely trying to grow the community so because a fair amount of people do come back and i do and i would like to also work out you know reach out more to our indian health services toyabi indian health services and get them involved in the clinic more you know and but it's growing slowly <laughs> Um, well, that was very helpful, and this overall session has been incredibly helpful and valuable, um, and, and I see that coming from folks in the chat as well. Like Much appreciation to both of you. We hear this relational component is so key, and we see that up here too. Um, people in Placer are saying, we can totally see this in the future. Um, lots of appreciation, the two different views of what rural health looks like. Lots, lots and lots of appreciation for both of you for sharing your expertise today and appreciation from us at CSHA as well. So thank you to both of you for the work that you do and for joining us today. And and, yeah. One other thing I would like to say, if anyone in, you know, wants to reach out to myself and I'm sure Nicole with any questions or, you know, to share issues, challenges, you know, often like I, I'm really alone here. <laughs> like, and it, so it's great to come to this meeting and talk to everyone too, but we're the only one here. So having community as rural people is great. So any contact from anyone with questions, comments would be much appreciated.
Absolutely. And we will definitely send out this recording as well as the slides, as well as any additional resources. And, and we'll try and connect folks who want to follow up with um, for any other resources they might want to share with one another. So, so thank you all for joining us. And please do remember to do your evaluation for the day. That's how we know um, what works and what doesn't in the conference. Um, you also get 50 points for your, for your raffle prizes. Um, and um, please join us at 12.15 for the closing session. And, um, and then join us in, in April in San Bernardino when we hopefully will all come together again in person because um, it will be lovely, like Colleen said, it's lovely to come together as a community and, and, um, and meet together and share these, share these stories. So thank you all. Thank you, Colleen Nicole. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone.